thank you for being here. I know the weather's been kind of spotty today, and it's not looking a whole lot better as the day goes on, so I appreciate you uh, coming to campus and spending time with us. My name is Derek Yonai, and I am the director of the Koch Center for Leadership and Ethics here at Emporia State University. The Koch Center's mission is to humanize business education, to help people understand that business is inherently social, and it's pro-human. That what we do is we use our gifts and talents, our creativity, to create value for other people and help create opportunities within our communities, as opposed to how it is businesses typically portrayed uh, in media and by other folks. Our Governance Law and Economics Lecture Series is designed to highlight the three institutions that have to work together to support and defend a free civil society. In order for us to have a free society, we have to have good governance. We have to have the rule of law. And we have to have market-based institutions where people can compete with each other on who's creating the most value for the most people. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Joe Coletti. Joe Coletti is a senior fellow at the Locke Foundation, where he studies state and local government spending and taxes. He previously headed a major government reform initiative in North Carolina that resulted in immediate restructuring and provided a model for future changes. Joe serves on the board of community groups and national boards in addition to advocating for policy change. And he has experience in for-profit, non-profit, and government settings. He has his degrees from John Hopkins University and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Uh, personally, I've known Joe for a while, so this morning I decided to look through my hard drive. And it was back in 2006 you gave our first lecture for me down at Campbell University. And the last time, strangely enough, Joe spoke at a lecture series for me was 10 years ago in 2009. So um, after 10 years, for me, three states. Uh, please join me in welcoming Joe Coletti to the ESU. Yeah, I, I realized on the flight here that uh, North Car the University of North Carolina is in Kansas City. Because I realized that because all of the sports reporters from North Carolina were on the flight with me. Um, it wasn't the basketball team because you know they take charter flights, but it was still kind of one of those things that, oh, wait, and uh, and we got Roy Williams, you guys got Derek Yonai, I think you still got the better end of the deal. So, um, and I, I say that in part because I went to the University of Michigan and we're still alive. Um, so, uh, so, on that, how many Jayhawks, how many, how many Jayhawks? No, yeah, one, two, okay. And the, the Emporia State just takes over, you report it, you're not, you're neither a Jayhawk nor, nor a Wildcat. Or Wildcats, no. um, so I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, to talk about what happened in Kansas and in North Carolina with tax reform. And the one of the reasons why it's uh, such, such an important topic still is that Kansas, I know that the tax cuts were, were a topic of debate <laughs> during the last governor's election, and I, I was refreshing myself on things and saw that Governor Kelly's, one of her best lines during the campaign was that uh, Chris Kovac was brown back on steroids. Um, and in North Carolina, this is a hard one to read, but the, the Raleigh News and Observer, the paper of record for the state capitol in North Carolina, said, had a line in this in a recent editorial saying, a rollback of the Republicans' Kansas-style trickle-down experiment is needed immediately. So Kansas has become kind of a catch-all epithet insult whenever anybody is looking to, to say that tax cuts are bad. And uh, in North Carolina, we like to say we got it right. And so what made the difference between the tax cuts here, the tax reforms here, and the tax reforms in North Carolina? Um, that's what we're going to go through. And part of it is just going back to 2012, 2013, what was leading to the reforms? And then talking about some of the specifics in, in, in North Carolina and here in Kansas. Why were the reforms done? What was the environment in which they were being done? What were the reforms that were implemented? How did the how did reforms actually take place? And then uh, taking a look at what were the results over the past five to six years, and what what comes next, and what do we recommend? 
And uh, so starting with why would anybody want to reform? And judging by the fact that most of you in here are students, I'm guessing that in 2012 you probably were not paying much attention to state politics and state, and state government fiscal policy. And for those who were adults, they probably didn't want to either. But um, we'll set the stage that 2010 is when the Tea Party got started. Um, and Republicans across the country won in wave elections, took over state legislatures, took over state governorships. 2012, the wave continued both in North Carolina and in Kansas and, and across a number of other states. The economy still was not doing well, even though technically we had been, by 2012, out of the recession for three years. Uh, and, and here in Kansas, we were looking at fracking as, and, and, and natural gas exploration as a great way to have economic development far into the future. And while the rest of the country has really benefited from the low natural gas prices and oil prices as a result of that, it hasn't exactly panned out everywhere uh, in, in terms of providing uh, economic boom out of that. But states across the country were looking at how do we improve our economy and create jobs when we know that Washington is not going to be able to provide that for us. Uh, so think about, put yourself back into that situation, whether you lived through that, whether you were consciously living through that or not, um, and think about what you would do. So one of the things that people looked at was hey, states with no income tax, especially Florida and Texas, they seem to be doing really well. And Nevada, well, Nevada has all kinds of things. But Florida and Texas is where most people focus. And said, you know, Texas, Governor Perry was talking about how he was taking more jobs from California than, Cal than people could move into California, and that he had space for in Texas. Um, and so Governor Brownback looked at, what if we got rid of the, the, what if we got rid of the income tax? And legislators in North Carolina had the same question, what if we got rid of the income tax? And, took, and, and, and followed that example. North Carolina, they also were looking at here in Kansas as well. This is an example from North Carolina that over 12 years, the state had spent $15 billion on economic development. And that was, and, and when we say spending on economic development, that means targeted spending and targeted tax cuts at individual companies to move into the state. Not to help everybody in the state, not to improve the business climate for all businesses, to make it easy to start a company, to make it easy to work and earn a living, but no, just to bring in the next company. And occasionally to help a company stay in the state or to move from one county to the next county. Um, that never happens here in, North, in Kansas, does it? Um, so, so the North Carolina legislature was specifically looking at how do we stop that from happening? How do we use our money better so that we don't have economic incentives targeting specific companies and instead do something that benefits everybody. So that leads to the why. And one of the things that, that everybody in North Carolina, because we had a couple of years to prepare for a Republican governor, one of the things that uh, those of us who were involved in policy did in, in, from the Chamber of Commerce to the John Locke Foundation brought in outside groups from, from Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. Uh, this is from the Tax Foundation. The Tax Foundation, Washington, D.C. based organization focused only on tax policy. I focus mostly on spending and so taxes seem like the sexy part of things. And for, like, and I know I start to you know, start to wonder about that. But um, most people are like, let's cut taxes. Most people don't worry about let's cut spending. But the Tax Foundation provides this side of, uh, of, uh, of taxes, and they have a ranking that is called the State Business Tax Climate Index. And the red bars here are, are Kansas, the blue bars are North Carolina. You want to be higher up with a lower number than to be lower down with a higher number. And you see that North Carolina overall is ranked 46th out of, just to remind you, 50 states. That's not good. Uh, we have a really bad tax climate. And so their goal was, how do we clean this up? While we're moving towards the goal, same as Governor Brownback had of no income tax, how do we move to that goal in a responsible way? Let's clean up our taxes. Make it simple, make it fair. 
And because of how they did that, North Carolina jumped from 46 to 12. Kansas, with its tax reforms, was 24th in the state pretty much about there. So while there is a huge income, while there's a huge fiscal impact of the changes here in Kansas, and we'll talk about some of what some of that was, the, the net impact, what people saw, didn't change much. Whereas in North Carolina, everybody got to see. This is much easier to fill out taxes. This is, it all makes much more sense. And it was so good, and this you can see how that jump happened for North Carolina, the blue bars versus the slight improvement and then the, and then the return of high taxes in, in Kansas. That you see the, the slight bump up and then return back down on the far left. Uh, so what happened in North Carolina, it, it, one of the benefits of it is that Governor Cooper, our, our current governor, uh, was recruiting Toyota and Mazda. They have a joint venture uh, electric vehicle hybrid plant that they were looking to, to move someplace in America a few years ago, or last year. And North Carolina was in the running for one of the last two finalists with Alabama. And in the $1.5 billion incentive package that the governor had put together, $500 million of that was the tax reform, just that we had low taxes. I took that as a huge win for North Carolina that this is something that applies to everybody and the governor is including it as, this is going to be really good for you, Toyota Mazda, if you come here because you're going to save $500 million on taxes compared to any place else that you go with in the Southeast. Um, so, you know, if you can say that this helps you as an individual company and it helps everybody too, yeah, that's a good thing. So, how did that, so, so that's what we got out of it and that's what we were looking for is, is how do you make the business climate better? North Carolina, and then this will sound familiar as well from Kansas, is that we had huge spending growth on the government side from 2002 to 2007-8. Before the bottom fell out of the economy and therefore out of government revenues, they were on a spending binge. And in North Carolina, they kept paying for this with temporary tax increases. We had, a, we had a temporary tax of a half cent in 2001, and in 2003 it was supposed to expire, and they extended it. And in 2005 it was supposed to expire, and they extended it again. And in 2007 it was supposed to expire, and they said, well, we'll keep half of it and make it permanent. Um, and so with that, they had 6.8% annual growth in spending over that time. And we have balanced budget requirements, so that means that revenues were growing by that amount, but part of that was that temporary tax. And uh, Dave Trauber, my friend here from Kansas Policy Institute, has the book that some of you picked up and that the rest of you should pick up. What really happened in, in, in Kansas, or what really was the matter? What was really the matter with the Kansas tax plan? I'll get the title right. Um, so made the point that uh, between 1993 and 2008, 16 years, eight times, Kansas had. A bank that had more spending than it had revenues. That's not a good sign. And North Carolina, though, was able to, over the net since 2011, get that under control. And then spending growth since then has been 2.6 percent. And we're going to talk about some of the challenges we have later, uh, currently. But if you can get spending down to this level, you can have a better tax environment than if you can't get spending down. And here in Kansas, that couldn't happen. In part because at the same time as the tax reform was being passed, you had the Supreme Court saying you need to spend more money on education. And the Supreme Court is still saying that. And I, I saw numbers earlier that it's like $1 billion over the next 10 years or up to $4 billion in schools. There's yeah, four billion dollars. No, one billion, four years. One billion, four years. I would, I'm even more depressed. Thank you. Uh, but and that and, and and school districts are suing again, and there's nobody who's ever come up with a this is the amount that you need to spend legislature and governor on education in Kansas to get to equitable funding and to get to the appropriate amount. So there's no ceiling on that, and. If there's no ceiling on education spending and, and you're under court orders to increase education spending and you have a tax plan that reduces revenue, that means that you're going to have to cut everything else in state government by much more. 
And education is the biggest chunk of state spending that you have, which means that everything else is going to have to be cut by a lot. These are technical terms. Um, and you can see some of that happening here, that these blue lines are North Carolina, the red lines again are Kansas, and Kansas had a huge run-up in revenues from 2010 to 2012, partly because of the oil exploration, partly because in 2012 the Bush tax cuts were expiring. And so everybody who had money, capital gains, other things, ways that they could adjust their income, brought their revenue into 2012, brought their income forward, so that, and claimed it with a lower tax rate. And unfortunately, your forecasting office read that as, this is what's going to happen in the future. All of this revenue is going to continue on, and we're going to continue to have this kind of growth. Not saying, oh, that was a one-time boom that we had because of expiring taxes. Um, and so you had, you had bad forecast, you had increased spending, and then you had a legislature that was at war with itself and with the governor. And the governor didn't brief everybody on what his plan was going to be and, produce, and handed it over. And the legislature said, we didn't, you didn't consult us. And some of the rogue elements within the Senate said, actually, we're not going to take a balanced plan. We're going to just cut. And so that ended up with a big hole. And so you had, you had lack of communication, no coordination, people that with cross purposes, higher spending, and a bad forecast. That is a recipe for disaster. North Carolina, we fortunately had a governor and a legislature that were working together, and a Supreme Court that was not going out and saying, you just need to spend more. We will tell you when you've spent enough on education. Um, and so that's what you, that's what you faced going into the tax cut, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit later about what happened once the tax cut was implemented and why you weren't able to, to get things going. But some of the how of, of the tax cuts, I mentioned that it was, it was a big decrease, um, and it had to be, it, it, it got reversed almost immediately. That the, on the sales tax side, the, the plan was to reduce it from a little over 6% to a little less. Immediately in 2013, there was tax, that was brought back up. And since then, now the tax rate on sales tax is higher than it was before. It's at 6.5%. In North Carolina, we had another one of those temporary sales taxes that I mentioned. Uh, this one was, after we finally let that old one expire, in 2009, there was a bad economy again, and so the governor at that time introduced a one cent sales tax increase, which in North Carolina equated to a million dollars. In the legislature, when the government, when the Republicans took over in 2011, they said, we're going to let that expire. And they did, and they found a way to make up that billion dollars of lost revenue with savings and with some, you know, some funny games with, with moving funds around. But they were able to get by, and they knew that it was a stopgap. But they had two years of experience by the time we had a Republican governor of uh, making things work on less money, so that when they said we're going to start take, cutting taxes, income taxes, they had some, some ability to do that. And you can see that we were able to keep that low sales tax across time. And then on the personal income tax side, the other major source of income for both states, Kansas kept two, uh, two, kept two, kept two of the three income tax brackets, uh, but cut those, cut the top tax bracket by a lot, cut the lower tax bracket by a fair amount, um, and then had to reverse that. North Carolina, you can see we had three tax brackets, brought that down to a single tax bracket, and that, and we were fortunate that our tax brackets were, were fairly close in terms of rates, and so when we reduced the top two rates, that wasn't a huge impact because when you cut a lot of money, when you cut people who are earning a million dollars and you cut their their income tax rate by a percent, you're cutting ten thousand dollars out of the state's out of the state's revenues at that point per person. If you cut it from and and if you do that across the board, that generates some some significant revenue lost. In North Carolina, because of the way that it was done. Uh, the, the revenues came down, but it was a slower process of cutting, of cutting rates than here in Kansas. 
and we had the same thing on the corporate income tax side, that, that rates came down slower, and we built in triggers so that we didn't end up with a situation of, we cut taxes and now we have to raise them. We had triggers that said, if revenues come in at a certain level, then we'll cut taxes further, but not, not ahead of time. Uh, and then we also reduced the itemized deductions. Both states tried to do this. North Carolina was able to succeed a little bit more. Reducing itemized deduction, increasing the standardized deduction on personal income, on personal income taxes, which again makes it fairer, simpler, easier. Everybody benefits, especially people at the lower end of the spectrum. Uh, and in North Carolina now we call it the zero, the zero tax bracket. And so on your first twenty thousand dollars starting January first of this year, you pay no income tax in North Carolina. So if that's all you earn, that's it. If you earn anything more than that, you're only paying that that five point two five percent income tax on every dollar that you earn from your two, from your twenty thousand and first dollar to your however much money you earn. So that's what happened in terms of putting it together. The results of it, one of the things that happened here in Kansas, we went through some of the pieces already, but the biggest one, you know, you had a, a failing, you had, you had agricultural prices falling, and, you, and I mentioned fracking a couple times in the oil exploration, and you can see what happened to the severance tax, which is the tax on stuff that comes out of the ground. Uh, oil, minerals, natural gas, anything that comes up from out of the ground, that gets severed from the land, uh, that is not agriculture, pays the severance tax. 2014, $125 million that the state brought in. 2016, $22 million. Now, a billion, $100 million, just to put that in perspective, your budget is $6 billion. So that's $100 million out of $6 billion. To bring that into terms that, that make more sense for the rest of us, you know, there's 6,000 students here. Imagine 100 students walk away. That's what we were looking at. Um, that would have a significant impact here. That, would, that has a significant impact on the state budget. And that happens as you're trying to get things under control and trying to stanch the damage from the, from the tax cuts. And now all of a sudden people are saying, oh, Kansas can't get its budget together because they cut taxes by too much, except for the fact that the severance tax wasn't a tax that you cut, it's just a tax that went away. So when you have things like this happening to you, it's really hard to get, to get ahead of the curve and, and, get your, and get it back on track. And you can see some of what's happening in the fiscal impact, that the blue bars on the Kansas side are the first round of income, uh, first round of tax cuts, and then you can see that everything after that is a tax increase. Starting in, 2000, starting in 2013, there's an immediate tax increase. And by the time you get to 2018, you can see that the combined tax increases are greater than the, uh, than the, than the tax decrease. In North Carolina, we started it relatively small, and it ramped up, and we've been adding to it since. So you can, you can see that the blue bars grow incrementally versus having a huge jump from year one to year two. Um, that was one of the things that we benefited from. And you can see on this side that revenues actually fell in Kansas for a number of reasons, as we, including the severance tax and the tax cuts. In North Carolina, as we cut taxes, because we had economic growth, we were able to continue having revenue growth over time for state government. And if you add back in the, the sales tax cuts, you can see that that sale, that the tax savings in North Carolina is fairly significant by this point. Um, what happened in the economy? So if all of this was done to make sure that the economy was growing in both states, eh, you might say that it worked, because, but the economy overall is doing well. Unemployment is at its lowest level in 20 years in the United States, and compared to, this, compared to the United States. And if you take a look back to tech, to before the recession, you know, better than Kansas has lower unemployment compared to the U.S. than it did back 12 years ago. I, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Kansas remains more productive than North Carolina. Per capita GDP in Kansas was $836 more than North Carolina in 2009. This year it's $2,222 more. 
So y'all are doing y'all are doing things well. Problem is, you don't have people coming here. I don't know that taxes was going to solve that in the first place, but you know, when you're in the when you're in the headlines for five years nationally for screwing up taxes, yeah, that's the, you're not going to get anybody to come here or you know, any more people to come here than otherwise would. Um, so North Carolina's population has grown three times faster. And as a result, our economy's been growing faster. And you can also see in this graph that North Carolina's economy had a significant uptick after 2014 when the tax, when the tax cuts went into effect. So it really did have an impact. Moving, so it wasn't just that the tax foundation was saying, you have a much better, much fairer, much simpler tax system, much better business, tax planner for businesses. You can see it. We had an impact on, on taxes, on, on, on business. And you can see that our, our growth continues to accelerate. Uh, not as fast as it did that year, but it still continues to accelerate. Whereas Kansas is uh, 2016 to 2017 flattened out. I haven't seen numbers for last year, um, but Probably hasn't, but hasn't changed much either. Um, and you can see that, that as well on the, on the growth rates when you take a look at it. You can see that spike a little bit better, and you can see that Kansas has been relatively flat at about 2% at 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 in the moment. Um, and we can, talk about, we can talk about the challenges that you all have this year with Medicaid expansion and the governor's. Uh, attempts and, and talk more about the Supreme Court, and I'd love to hear from, from you all on that side. But this is what we're facing in North Carolina. Is that um, you, I, I, I shared that headline from the Raleigh News and Observer at the start about we're going the road to Kansas, um, and they've been saying that since we passed the tax reform in 2013. So immediately since it's so, you know, six years later, there you would think that their cries of the sky is falling would eventually stop being effective, but. Um, if, but the challenge that, that I see in North Carolina is that we we had that 2.6% spending growth per year for about five or six years. Last year, spending grew about 3.8%. And that was with the legislature playing a couple games to hide some spending. It actually grew over 4%, which doesn't sound like a lot. But this graph here shows you that if we have 4.7% growth, which is essentially if we keep doing everything in government the way that we've been doing it, it's going to grow about that rate. Revenues are down here at the gray bars. That red line is way above those gray bars. Um, if we keep spending at that 2.6%, we do well. That yellow is about what inflation and population growth in North Carolina is. In Kansas, obviously, given what I showed you, it's going to be a lot lower. Um, it's, going to, it's going to be closer to, it, it, it'll actually be below that, that green line here if we look at Kansas. The spending per person is going to have to be less than 2.6% growth. So again, think about that in terms of Medicaid expansion, education, and all the other commitments that have already been made or are being promised. It's, that's a bad situation. Um, North Carolina is, we spent that much last year. The governor this year has recommended 5.6% spending increase. Uh, about a billion and a half dollars. The legislature is looking at an equivalent, in equivalent terms, about a billion dollars spending increase. Um, those are not sustainable. And if we have spending growth like that, um, I, I was concerned when our legislature cut, in, imposed their last billion dollar tax cut, which takes effect this year. I'm kind of happy about it, right, obviously. But, um, I knew that if they couldn't get the spending under control, we were going to run into the same problem that you all are running into. And their spending increase this year looks like it's potentially going to take us down that road. And our governor is looking at Medicaid expansion in the same way. And so, you know, what I'm, I'm, I'm here as much for you all to help us as to, for us to help you. Like, now you know the story of what it worked in North Carolina. And, and we have a story about what's gone wrong here in Kansas, and we're in danger in North Carolina of doing the same thing that you all did, which was spend too much and, and not have enough available. 
and the spending and the problem is on the spending side, not on the tax side. Um, and that's what we're that's what we're facing here. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you talk to your friends or family in North Carolina, you know, or you talk to your legislators or anybody else here in Kansas, say, look, North Carolina is running the same thing we are because they're spending too much. They've been able to make it this far, and we want to be we want our state to remain as the example so that you all can point to North Carolina and say, look, this is what can happen. And if we screw that up, then that doesn't give you any room to to, to show a positive example anymore. Um, so, and we would love for Kansas not to be considered like the bad place, the place that did it wrong. We want you to be, we want you to be in the same place that we are, and we don't want to end up in, the, we don't want to both end up in the same place of, oh uh, yeah, you don't want to do Kansas or North Carolina. We want both of them, we want everybody to say, do, do North Carolina, or do that second round of Kansas. That one worked. So, some of the recommendations for, to accomplish that, don't overreach. Don't, don't cut too fast, don't cut too quick. Um, Start small and expand instead. Improve your forecasting. Some of that happened already because given the bad forecasts in 2016, the governor had a, had a blue ribbon panel that said, yeah, here's some things that we do poorly. Like one of the things is having the last round of revenue forecasts come before April 15th. April 15th, tax guy is? Oh, that's tax day. Tax day, right. So on tax day, everybody who owes money is not filing because, oh, who wants to pay early, um, um, and everybody, and so that can lead to what we in North Carolina call the April surprise. Sometimes that's a really good surprise. Hey, we got a lot more money. Sometimes that's a really bad surprise. Ooh, that didn't work. Um, but if you budget after you get that surprise and you know what you have, then it much, then it's much easier, and you can actually balance. If you but if you set the budget saying we're going to earn something way up here, and that April surprise is down here. And you've spent money as if you had money up here, but well, you know that's going to pay back. So wait until after April 15th before you start setting, before you budget, and, and have the revenues available to know that. Uh, commit to lower spending per person and operating deficits. I mean, eight years out of 16, and it looks like four out of the next five years are going to be in the same situation. Um, that's unsustainable. I mean, clearly, uh, I mean the federal government, notwithstanding. That doesn't, work, that doesn't work. Um, one of the things that North Carolina has uh, that, 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 that Kansas does not is a savings reserve. And as we were as we were reducing revenues and cutting spending, we were able to save up $2 billion before last summer. So North Carolina had set aside $2 billion out of a, uh, so I said Kansas has a $6 billion budget, North Carolina has a $24 billion budget. Set aside $2 billion out of that. Um, which was really, really important because last fall we had something called Hurricane Florence that caused about $17 billion worth of damage to North Carolina. Uh, federal government put aside some money, private enterprise put aside some money, local, local nonprofits did, churches, everybody came together. The state was able to take from that savings reserve fund, what we call rainy day fund, they were able to take $750 million and spend that last year to help with relief and recovery efforts. We couldn't have done that without the savings reserve. We couldn't have done that, uh, and, or, or if we did that, we would have been finding money here and there and cutting all kinds of other programs. Kansas doesn't have that option. So if you had a major, if you had a major event happen here, and there's no savings, there's no rainy day fund, that means that you're going to have to go back into things, and and that's what you've been running into along the way, right? If you had built up savings as you were running into those, those budget, those, those, those gaps, and as the severance act was falling, you would have been able to make up for that. Um, so put one of those in place and fund it. Um, and, uh, and, and the tax foundation provides you with a good measure of something to look for, so uh, for what kinds of policies they're implement. Um, those are my are main points. I think I've left plenty of time for questions and comments. Uh, so, Derek, I'll tell you, I'll let you tell me when to stop, but what do you think? Questions, comments, did I say something wrong? Yes, sir. Uh, during your talk, you've got some very wide, wide brushes in terms yes. of concepts, but uh, spending is important on what you spend. Yes. Spending increases 
uh, depends what you're spending on. Mm -hmm. uh, so what are what were they spending on specifically in more detail? Um, Frivolous spending that mm -hmm. map. What right. were they spending it on? Well, there, the, 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 there's a certain point at which it does it does matter, but there's also a certain point at which if you're spending too much, you're just spending too much. And a lot of that money was having to go to education. What happens within the education budget with that money? I don't know. I just know that Supreme Court says that you're still not spending enough. Um, so, I don't know, Dave, can you can you help me out on that? Sure. What was some of the spending that was happening during this time that that just kept going up? And yeah. Well, most of the hi everybody. Uh, most of the challenge was that, as, as Joe said, Kansas didn't cut spending to begin with. We did an analysis in 2012, a couple of months after the uh, tax cut was was uh, passed, voted into law, and it didn't go into effect until 2013. Kansas only would have needed to pull about eight and a half percent out of out of spending at one time, or maybe two percent a year out over several years. That's just eliminating a little bit of waste. Um, and, and to give you an idea of how much Kansas might waste, uh, when this all came up, we started to talk. We had a lot of conservatives come to us and said, look, we love this idea, but how are you going to run government on less revenue? And so we went out and looked at all 50 states. And what we found was, some of you are old enough to remember this, some of you aren't, it was like one of those old VA loans. It's the spending. North Carolina, for example, spends 24% less per resident than Kansas spends. On average, the states that tax income spend 50% more than the states without an income. 50%. Every state has the same basic basket of services. It really comes down to how much you're spending. It's because you're absolutely the gentleman in the back of the was, yes, it does matter what you spend money on, but it also matters are you spending what you need to spend, or as most cases in government, it's, well, we spent this much last year, therefore we have to spend more. We tend to measure how well we're doing or how much we care by how much we spend, rather than what outcome are we getting for this spending. And so Kansas has lots of opportunities. There were efficiency studies presented where Kansas could have saved money. Uh, I'll give you one example. Last year, Kansas spent a billion dollars on fees for services. Want to guess what the top two categories were? Miscellaneous and other. How in the world? Now, legislators don't know this because they don't even get that kind of information. But even if you got it, how will you know where to start? Because the system isn't designed for it. So it's, it's I mean, Kansas can continue to increase, and you're right, most of that did go to uh, education, but it didn't need to. And by the way, schools still had hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank. Yeah, and, and, uh, and they mentioned the, the uh, efficiency study and, and, and Derek mentioned that in North Carolina I worked on a government reform initiative. Uh, one of, I, I talked to some of the folks in, in the legislature and legislative staff as, as that effort was being ramped up here in Kansas about who do you who do you go to and uh, they brought in a company called Alvarez and Marcel and Alvarez and Marcel had an unbelievably large number uh, but, it, but it was a lot of small things that you can do uh, and I don't think any of it was implemented. Um, and whereas, whereas in North Carolina, we implemented, we ended up with only 21 recommendations, but about 14 of those were implemented, either by the governor or in law. In, in Kansas, you had literally hundreds of recommendations, and, and pretty much none. Of them. So there, there's a lot of there's a lot of room for spending to look at spending on that. So yes, sir. Uh, my understanding. I'm fairly new to Kansas, but my understanding was that, that part of the, the, the tax cuts were meant to be stimulative. What, how effective, how would you eva evaluate the uh, efficacy of, the, of, of that goal? Yeah, well, um, to judge from my numbers, um, and, and, and part of that, I think, is the, is the nature of tax cuts. That's where the that, that tax foundation ranking is really helpful. What are you doing with your tax cuts to the same same kind of point? It, it's one thing to have low taxes. It's another thing to have effectively low taxes. It's one, you know, you can have high spending 
or low spending, if you're not if you're spending it in the wrong way, it doesn't matter, right? You're spending too much if you're spending it poorly. Uh, you might not be spending it enough if you're spending well and you're getting the outcomes that you want. Um, so on the tax on the tax side, no, they were not they were not as stimulated as one would have hoped. They were not they were, they were pretty much not stimulated at all. I mean, but it's hard to know because of everything else that was going on. You know, with the agricultural prices and the, and the oil and gas prices and what happened on, on in both of those two fronts, how much of that, you know, where the balance was on those things. Uh, the, the, the one thing that, that Kansas took a lot of heat for was the pass-through income tax cut, which said that if you are, uh, if you get your income, if your company is structured in a way that you're taking the income on your personal taxes, instead of paying for it as the company and then paying yourself a salary out of that, then that doesn't get taxed or it gets taxed at a lower rate compared to corporations. Um, and everybody said, oh, this is awful, it's going to be terrible. And, and there were some people who made a switch from a corporation, a traditional corporation, to one of those pass-throughs, but the income effect was fairly minimal. And it also didn't lead to a lot of new jobs being created. The research that I saw on it said that that may have had as much to do with the fact that nobody expected the tax cut to stay around because everybody hated it as, as anything else. And so, right, once you have a tax cut that goes into effect and immediately you're starting to raise taxes, you're undercutting the, the ability of that tax cut to have any kind of long-term impact. Whereas in North Carolina, again, it was one, one tax cut slowly being implemented over time. And so there was greater confidence that those tax cuts were going to stay around more reason to, to do something that we really could benefit from. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Is North Carolina going to pass Medicaid exchange? Uh, one of the great things about politics is that when you're running for office, your 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 uh, your policies change. Uh, and so the Republican who was in favor of it and had a and so it would have made a bipartisan and the, and the main sponsor of it. You're recording this part still. Um, <laughs> Is, is running for office, uh, running for Congress, and so it has to get through a primary. Uh, and it's a, and it's a seat that just came open this year. And as he's running for Congress, he's not going to be pushing his Medicaid, his Medicaid expansion bill. Um, so there's less likelihood of a bipartisan outcome on that side. Uh, the governor claims that he is going to keep everybody around and not and continue vetoing budgets until they include Medicaid expansion. I don't think you can. I, uh, so, my, I'm fairly confident that it is not going to happen in North Carolina. Can't say the same. Is it going to happen here? That's uh, yeah. So, anybody else? Students, what would you have done? observation yes, and, and hopefully it's for the good of the order. Uh, I, I was in the legislature for 14 years including during the time that uh, we we did the tax cut. Um, in 2013 I may have been the deciding vote uh, for the governor's uh, need to extend our sales tax at the higher level. I voted yes. Um, at that point, it was represented to those of us who voted yes that it was packaged in such a way that there were additional income tax cuts in the out years. So even though we were voting for a short-term uh, increase in sales tax, uh, the net long-term result was a sales tax cut. But, but having that experience and looking at your presentation, um, I don't find it very useful, never did, uh, to uh, look at one state versus another state. Uh, we looked uh, over and over and over again uh, when we were considering the tax cut in 2012, for example, at Texas and at Florida and at Washington and at Seattle or Washington, uh, and didn't we want to be uh, like those uh, no income tax states that were uh, growing uh, at a very healthy pace. Um, 
we're, we're different. We're a lot different than um, North Carolina. Your budget is at least four times, five times, and oh, by the way, and I think David will confirm, our, our budget isn't six billion, it's about, what, 7.6 billion now? Yes, yeah. Uh, and, and growing, but uh, I, I do like the, the opportunity to uh, look at the, at the 50 states, and the, the Tax Foundation is a great source of information, uh, and, and to focus on uh, states that that are more similar to Kansas in our in size and, and income. One question I had, and I have no idea what the answer is. Uh, for example, I mean, Kansas is a very high state burden education state, and, and all 50 states are different. North Carolina is it more of a local burden, or, or is it state burden, or is there? A, Comparable there? Yeah, uh, we are we are comparable with that. Uh, North Carolina, all operating most operating expenses are paid by the state. So teacher salaries, all of those things are paid at the state level. Uh, the look the counties, we don't, we have 117 school districts. For the most part, it's one school district per county. Um, and so Wake County, where I live, where Raleigh is, uh, has 150 thousand students. That's probably not a good thing, but that's just where we are. Um, and uh, so there's a great variation in the size of our, our school districts from about 600 students to 150,000 students. But we have fewer school districts, which means that there's less administration, but it is all handled at the, at the state level for the most, for the most part. The, the local governments are able to provide supplemental payments for teachers and other things uh, based in part on cost of living. But yeah, so we are fairly similar on that side. That capital is handled for the most part at the local level, and operations are handled for the most part at the state level. I appreciate you being here, and, and appreciate the, the Koch Center's presence here as well. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I, I point out to <laughs> legislators all the time in North Carolina and, and people at, on, at the local level um, is, you know, for us, it's really easy. We get to say, this is what you should do. Um, you know, and, and we used to put together alternative state budgets in North Carolina, and, and people would come up and say, well, this is really good. How, how come they don't do that? I said, because I only have to please one person, and this budget has to please 170 people, or at least 86 of them, right, um, in order to become law. Uh, and so that, there's a lot that goes into the decisions that happen within legislatures um, that really, you know, you talk to folks and, and what's, what's the number you're concerned about? It's not about 7.6 billion or 6 billion or 24 billion or anything else. It's about 50 plus one, right? 50% plus that one extra person to vote for. What is it that we can do that will get that vote? And, um, and, and this, is, uh, this, is, this is one of Professor Yonai's favorite things about the choice, right? Well, who's the median voter? Where's that person right in the middle? And what is it going to take them to come to your side? Uh, and when it comes to, to taxes, if everybody's in agreement, when it comes to spending, if everybody's in agreement, then it doesn't take a lot. When you have to get somebody from the other side to go with you, uh, that's going to take a little bit more. Uh, and so that's, that's where these things really become difficult at, at the local level, at the state level, and, and in, in reality compared to the, 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 the the, the, the think tank uh, purity. So, thank you for serving. Anybody else? Does either state do a, I'm going to call it a bang for the buck study on agencies and so on? They try. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, I, I've worked with a few different states. Um, and taking a look at, at their budgets and at their spending and at their taxing and trying to help them out. Uh, there was one, a few years ago I worked with uh, the state of Illinois, with the, the, the state think tank up there. Um, yeah, I heard laughter. It, I mean, you want to talk about impossible to save? Illinois. Um, and uh, they actually have a state agency in Illinois whose sole purpose, sole measure of success, 
is how many people did we get to sign up for all the other programs that we have where we give money to people? That's how they measure success. So if your goal is to get people to sign up for a program that may or may not be good for them in the long run, then yes, that's a great thing if you got more people to sign up for it. If your goal is to actually make it so that they don't need your program anymore, so that they can be self-sustaining and can live on their own, you know, and can, can be a flourishing member of society, yeah, that's not the measure, but that's what they measure on, because that's what they can measure, that's what they know. They, they say, if we get more people signed up, then that brings us a bigger budget. If we're missing getting people signed up, then we need a bigger budget so that we can go out and recruit them to join us, all right? Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the measuring what does government do and how effective is it at that uh, becomes a really tricky question when you ask someone, you know, if you ask me, are you, are you doing a really good job at what you're doing? Let's see, I've written papers, I've, I've come out to Kansas to talk. Yeah, I'm successful. You want know, to talk about what is, what is North Carolina's budget and have I succeeded in keeping that low? I'll tell you in about six months. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that you had a smaller number of school districts in North Carolina? Yes. Is that just the way it was, or did you consolidate? There was a, there was consolidation that was happening uh, for a while. North Carolina did have a number of city school districts. Uh, we have 100 counties, we have 117 school districts, so that tells you that we didn't get there all the way. Um, at some point, it also turned into those last remaining city school districts. Um, you might have heard of a city called Chapel, a town called Chapel Hill. Um, it's in a rural county, and it has its own school district. It kind of doesn't want to be part of the county school district. Um, and so that's kind of what where we are with those last remaining 17 school districts. Um, and so there was a deliberate consolidation of school districts from, I do not know what the original number was. It was far greater than 117. Um, but there's also we've also reached the point where um, if you count charter schools as individual school districts, which essentially they are, we are closer to we are well over 300 school districts. We have about 200 charter schools in the state, um, and those are funded at the same rate, the same way from the state as the as the, as the traditional school districts are, um, but they do not get capital money. From the counties, they have to raise their own capital money and take that out of that operating expense that they have. So um, they are actually much more efficient on a per student, per do, on, a, on a dollar per student basis than traditional schools are, and they're achieving the same results. And so that's leading some consideration in North Carolina about can we change how we fund all the schools? Can we do this on a per student basis instead of saying, well, you've got administration that you have to have, that's going to that's going to be this allocation here. And you have to have so many people in the in the back office, and that's going to be this amount of money. You have to have right. So instead of having multiple buckets, it, charter schools seem to get by without all those buckets and without all that administration. How can we do that at, 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 on, a, on, a, on a district level? And, and for those districts that are 600 students instead of 150,000 students, right, if they outsource some of that back office to one of the 150,000 student districts, nobody's going to notice, but they'll get they'll get the job done, and they'll do it for less money than if they. And, and, and get a better job than trying to hire somebody to go out into the middle of uh, into the middle of a county that only has six hundred students. So yeah, deliberate consolidation, but it, it, a lot of other things going on. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit. I want you to focus on university funding. Obviously, many of us have a vested interest in that. Let's try to get let's try to get beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, if we were to go back when I came to ESU and over the first decade or so. Um, Typical student would pay 18% of the cost of running this place. The vast majority would come from the people of the state of Kansas. We don't get much federal funding here. That might be different from your research triangle and some other institutions. Now, the state of Kansas is contributing less than a third. Um, we're on a glide path towards really small numbers in KU. It's down in the low 20s. Um, when we talk about decreased spending, is that a wise idea? In, in higher education specifically, yeah. and then effectively having our students pay a much higher percent of that. Yeah. Um, see, that federal funding needs to be weird. It, it subsidizes student loans, but it doesn't fund, it, it effectively lets them borrow against their future. 
Yes. Um, so yeah, we, in, in North Carolina, we have a couple flagship schools that do get a lot of research grant, do get a lot of money in research grants that doesn't really get counted properly. Right. Yeah. It shows up as this huge number if you take a look at the university's budget and we look at the state's version of what the budget is. It's too don't match. I've tried seven times and it, it just it, there's no match in this one. But to your actual question, uh, yeah, states, uh, all states are reducing the amount of funding that they, or the percentage of funding per student that they that they provide. Uh, North Carolina, we have three schools that are called uh, uh, North Carolina Promise Schools that uh, have had declining enrollment, and the state now says that there's a $500 tuition promise, $500 per, per semester. That's all it costs, but I mean, plus room and board and all the other things, and so it ends up being about the same amount. But um, but it, but you get a, a, a significant discount on tuition for those three schools in specific. Um, and this, and I have, a, I have a son who's applying to college. And the funny thing is that regardless of what the price tag is, right, that we supply to schools that are that are advertised at seventy two thousand dollars per year, and he's applied to the uh, University of North Carolina, which is advertised as seventeen thousand twenty thousand dollars. When we get to the what is the cost out of pocket before loans, they're all within about three thousand dollars of each other. So, the, if we talk about what is the state doing with its money and who is it subsidizing, there's a huge question there. If we want to make sure that we're funding low-income students to be able to come to a state school and encourage state students who are low-income to come to a state school, then that's one way to consider funding, and that's what those large private universities do, and that's what states do with out-of-state students. They say, we want you here. Here's the money that will make it affordable. Here's the money that will actually make it about the same price as your in-state tuition at your home school. And that's one way to think about it that might actually be a better way to go about it than having low tuition, low advertised tuition rates that end up being the same net cost per student for everybody. Because how many of you students were going to go to college regardless of whether it was here or KU or Creighton or someplace else? How many of you were going to go to school regardless? Okay. It's pretty much all of you. So is it a good use of the state's money for somebody who can afford it to go to school at a discount? instead of putting that money into somebody who needs the money to go to school. I, I, I think that's one of those fundamental questions that we have to ask. Because It's not like states are running overflowing with money. It's not like the federal government has, I mean, the federal government is borrowing a billion, a trillion dollars a year. Right? Every new dollar that we spend on Medicaid expansion in North Carolina or in Kansas this year is going to be borrowed from your students or your students' children or grandchildren, if the, if the federal government lasts that long. Right? That debt is eventually catching up to us. Yeah, not to depression or anything. Um, but that debt eventually catches up to us. And so you can't look to federal government to bail us out and to, to keep all of the subsidy going. And so what is the best use of money? Is the best use of money to make life easier for wealthy people and at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to be able to say, that's what's wrong with America, who went to Boston University, by the way. Um, there's, I don't know. I don't have good answers to a lot of these questions. Um, I just don't know that we fund things the right way, and it does, make, it does raise a lot of questions. So it's a very good question. I just don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> Anybody else? We have time for one more. All right, so please join me in thanking uh, Joe for his presentation.